Hello, good afternoon. My name is Akrivi Vivian Cusi. Uh, I'm welcoming everybody interested on application track three, transport, mobility, and logistics. I'm the subgroup leader for BDVA for this particular track. Today, I'm not alone. I'm co-chairing with Christoph Pelo. He's the global head of Bosch Center for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, actually, uh, in this particular track, the, co the community is uh, growing uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, we are here uh, because of business and research curiosity. Why uh, we're searching for big data in transport? And this is the main discussion we're going to do here today and how AI is also involved. Currently, the transformation of the multimodal transportation ecosystem is happening now. There are many changes uh, which are rapid, especially from the strides uh, coming from uh, new um, challenges like COVID uh, and other examples we have and involve all modes of transportation. What uh, is required here? New players uh, use the power of real-time data to offer personalized door-to-door -door travel and logistics services. At the same time, there is an expressed need for an economical, flexible, safe, and more sustainable way to get from A to B. This is the question. Everybody wants to move uh, easily, uh, without trouble, and with the needs of use. Uh, and how that can be achieved by a road, rail, air, or water. So big data in, in transport. In most countries of the EU, entrants are challenging the existing transport practices and services, naming them as unable to fully satisfy a never-ending demanding audience. People want more and more, and at the same time, uh, they're quite reluctant for every new change which is happening. Providers leverage the use of mobiles to create new relationships with travelers. And at the same time, Societies are striving. They are questing uh, on new ideas and services to reduce the CO2 footprint. And especially the 2050 agenda is putting more strive on that. Thus, sustainability becomes an important additional aspect of mobility and our mobility concepts. In this particular track that we are welcoming uh, everybody today, we want to identify concrete use cases for big data in AI that actually feed our business and research curiosity. We cover all the fields of transport, mobility, and logistics that can be offered by intelligent services of an overarching mobility platform. We target on many areas of interest, and some of those we will hear today with the six proliferate speakers that we have on board. We touch ideas on shared mobility, utilizing existing infrastructure for e-mobility, smart logistics. We discuss some concepts on, of an overarching mobility, open platforms, and, and so on. The interesting part is that uh, these six proliferate uh, use cases uh, would feed the ideas uh, of the developing uh, contributions of the track. I will pass the roof to Christoph. We will introduce you to the speakers that we have on board today. And later on, we can have the time to have also a chat with them and address them some targeted questions. Christoph. Thank you, Thank you. Vivian, for the, for the kind introduction of our, um, of our track. And um, let me welcome everybody who joined this track and as interest how AI can shape the field of mobility, we are glad that we could uh, uh, could bring in uh, some, some um, renowned speakers and participants in European efforts of utilizing AI for the field of logistics, of uh, transportation, and because we all feel that um, here, this is a field where AI really can make a difference and, uh, and Europe can develop to a an, an leading uh, location. Uh, some of our participants here are from the Plattform Lander Systeme. This is an, an, an endeavor 
which is to bring uh, expertise from business and from academia um, to, uh, <clears throat> uh, to, to uh, in, a, in, a, in a joint forum together uh, and uh, help people to understand the offerings. However, the limitation and risks of AI when bringing that into such fields like, uh, like uh, mobility and logistics, which will shape our future. The other participants are from major European um, uh, endeavors, and so that we think that we can present you uh, with a panelist. We are here, a good overview about activities throughout Europe in that field. In the, um, to save perhaps more time for questions afterwards, um, without further ado, I would like now that we start the session. Um, we, since we are limited in time, um, we do not offer the, uh, the possibility to ask questions immediately after the talk, uh, since we have uh, a panel discussion to save your questions then, and uh, then we will have an, an, an operated uh, discussion. This is due to the fact that um, uh, unless we do so, then uh, the, the time constraints could be heard and, and uh, the presentation time of some panelists eaten up. I hope you understand this. We have a short shift in the agenda because uh, Dr. Rudolf Heli has to leave, unfortunately, earlier. So he will be number two in speakers and uh, there will be no direct possibility to address him with questions. But if you ask questions for him, please um, uh, um, mark that in the chat and we will route then the questions that you might get the answer later per email. So, um, so far to the housekeeping rules. And now without further ado, the first keynote speaker is, uh, is Dr. Uh, uh, Georgakis from uh, University of Wolverhampton. Now the floor is yours, thanks. Okay, uh, thanks for the introduction, um, uh, Christoph. So, uh, my name is, um, I hope you can see my screen. My name is uh, Panos um, George Ikes. I'm from the University of uh, Wolverhampton in the UK. And the title of my presentation is uh, Data Driven uh, Technological Solution for Mobility as a Service. And, and my presentation is really about um, a Horizons 2020 project, which actually finished last week. Uh, and it was in the area of uh, mobility as a service. Uh, so the name of the project was uh, Mass for You. And uh, the main aim of the project is to design, develop and deploy uh, a number of uh, mass schemes in different uh, regions in, 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 in Europe. And as part of this process, we um, endeavor to collect some evidence about uh, good practices, barriers, enablers, um, and those were under four pillars. So we looked at the business, uh, the business side, the end user side, the technology side, and the policy side. And my presentation today is mainly for the technology and data. Um, oops, sorry about this. Moving off my mouse. Just go back. Okay. Okay. It's better to use the keyboard. Okay. So this is the overall approach for the for the Mass for You project. And um, due to the time constraints, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. But um, on the on the top right, you can see the sort of the technology side. And uh, the idea was to develop a number of different components that can support mass, um, and not only the mass, the users of the mass, uh, being the travelers, but also uh, the key stakeholders, uh, operators, um, mass operators, and, and and mobility service providers as well. So I'm going to go into a, a bit more detail today about uh, two of the components. Those were components that actually utilized quite a lot of data and quite a lot of external APIs. Uh, the first one being a journey planner, which of course was a sort of a, a key component to assist the, the user to um, utilize all the different mobility services that were part of MASS. And the second one was a, a recommender system, 
which was assisting the, the, the traveler, but also the stakeholders um, in, in different sort of decision making processes. And so just to give you a, 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 brief, a brief background about the pilots that we had as part of the project, we uh, looked at uh, three different uh, cities. Uh, and uh, one of the characteristics of uh, our project was the, uh, the, the different sort of business cases for those cities in terms of who the mass operator would be. So we looked at the uh, cases where the mass operator was a private organization. We looked at case where the, the mass operator was the sort of the regional authority that um, supervises all the sort of transportation services. And we also had an, a, a case where the mass operator was um, a, a public transport operator. Uh, so in terms of the technology platform, on the left-hand side is the, the sort of uh, platform that we developed. And as you can see, we had a number of different components communicating with each other. At the bottom, we had all of the, the sort of the, the data input to the platform. So quite a few different external uh, data sources or APIs. And, and then uh, we uh, had to find a way to actually integrate and, and process all this data. So on the right hand side, we came up with this concept of a, an API of APIs that receives information from different data sources and through some transformation process, it can actually convert the data into a harmonized format that can, that it can be used actually for from the different components of the platform. And uh, of course, because the data are coming in many different uh, sizes and shapes, we sort of came up with a common information model Model to to support um, you know the, the data requirements of the project and, and and that was a combination of existing standards where those were available but also some no some new data structures for things that were new in terms of uh, implementation of mass and uh, we actually adopted a, a sort of a big data architecture that was developed as part of another H20. 20 project, uh, Optimum, uh, which um, finished a couple of years ago. And um, the idea was to allow the real-time stream analytics. So we, we uh, collected data from different sources uh, in real time. Uh, some of them were um, very high velocity, high, high uh, volume data, especially from sensors um, on, the, on the road network. And um, in, we, we try to actually create stream, um, stream analytics and, and uh, integrated number of machine learning sort of uh, algorithms to uh, do prediction and, and try to understand better what happens in the supply. And uh, as an example, we use the traffic data to, to sort of carry out traffic forecasting, which is um, what you see on the, on the top right of the, of the screen. And um, this, uh, this is an example of data in, in the West Midlands region of the UK, where I'm actually situated. And it's data from uh, many different sensors on the high end network or also on, on an urban and environment as well. And the idea, of course, is to try to understand how the traffic will be in the next hour and use that as part of the services that we provide to the travelers. We also did quite a bit of work on actually using social media data. And that's what you see on the bottom right of the screen and uh, especially from the Twitter. So we're trying to actually collect data from, from Twitter, try to understand which of those data uh, or tweets were actually related to traffic scenarios, and then try to understand uh, what was the sentiment of the users uh, where um, you know, those tweets were actually published. And, and based on that, we could actually come up with those sort of sentiment uh, heat maps to see areas maybe where people are quite unhappy with the transport services and of course uh, you know um, use that as well as part of our um, um, services. Uh, so the first component uh, that uh, I'm going to be talking about is a journey planner. This is for uh, a journey planner that can support mass and of course the the, the difficulty of mass is there is a, a number of different services that have to be sort of integrated in a journey planner. And these services, or the majority of them, are dynamic. So we had things like um, floating car sharing, floating bike sharing, and, and, and um, of course the positions of the vehicles change in real time. So how to take that into account? Uh, so we, uh, I'm going to go into into a, a bit more detail about about how we we sort of approach this problem. But um, we, we had two sub components mainly to to do to do this task, and uh, we had the, a journey planner that was actually receiving data from external APIs and was, was passing that that data through sort of a pipeline. 
um, to, to do some sort of optimization and come up with different different routes. And also we had the, what we call a supply demand optimizer. So that component was actually responsible for collecting data in real time from, from different services. Um, but all, um, in terms of the supply, but also looking at the users themselves. And again, using Twitter or using historical information about the travel uh, behaviors of the users to make, uh, um, develop develop uh, or construct routes that, that match the user profiles and past behavior. Uh, so uh, on this slide, is, is, uh, it looks a bit busy, but on the right-hand side is this sort of processing pipeline that I mentioned earlier. So um, we used quite a, a few of the existing APIs that can actually generate uh, what we call unimodal routes, so routes that actually uh, utilize one mode of transport because we didn't actually want to reinvent the wheel. There are quite, quite powerful APIs out there can act that can actually do that. And once we receive those sort of initial uh, routes that uh, were um, using a single mode of transport, then we started this process where we have to collect data from different MSPs um, in, in real time uh, and, and do some optimization. And, and the under, underlying sort of approach that we followed was to have a number of different use cases or scenarios, we call them, in terms of uh, the configuration of the trip. So for example, we had one use case where um, you know, the last mile of a, a particular trip would be done by a public transport and, and uh, the access to, 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 to the sort of uh, closer to the city would be, done, would be done by a service like Uber. So, um, so that, that scenario would actually generate routes that the Uber would be the first leg and the public transport would be the second leg. And, and uh, through this sort of pipeline, we try to find um, you know, the optimal way of actually constructing that route using uh, real-time information. And on the left-hand side is the implementation approach. So we try to use microservices to implement, the, let's say, the solution. And that allows us to uh, have a very sort of flexible um, <clears throat> system where we can actually integrate new services quite easily. Uh, we just need to create a new service. Uh, so any, uh, any, any mobility service that uh, needed to be integrated was very, very easy to do. The only thing we have to, have, have to do was basically just create a data adapter to get the data uh, into our sort of system, into our platform. And, and those data were actually directly integrated to the rest of the platform. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of this uh, supply demand optimizer, what we, uh, we, we looked at different things. So the first one was to um, use this sort of big data analytics to try to identify incidents on the network. Uh, and incidents could be anything in terms of maybe an area on the, on the network that maybe congestion was starting to actually be uh, generated. Uh, but we also used quite a, quite a bit of <clears throat> real-time information from sources that um, are actually dedicated to reporting incidents. Uh, we use real-time um, data in terms of the uh, operation of services. So if, if a particular service maybe was delayed, we, we needed to take that into account and we, we did that. Um, we use again social media uh, in, in different ways. So social media uh, in terms of looking collectively about what happens in a particular area of the network, but also from individuals. So we used, uh, for example, um, imaging uh, processing, and we used, let's say, uh, NLP to analyze text information that's coming from the individuals to try to detect the sentiment or the, let's say, the emotional status of the individual before they travel. So if there's a tweet by an individual a few minutes before, uh, you know, he comment or they commence the trip. Um, and, and, and that individual maybe was a bit unhappy, then we try to actually generate routes that do not um, overcomplicate things a lot for that individual, maybe routes that they are familiar with and so on and so forth. If the individuals maybe was in a better mood, maybe we could promote other things like, you know, cycling, walking, more active modes um, that, that could maybe fit that sort of emotional uh, status of the user. And um, so we, we, again, we used data, uh, different type of data to actually support, let's say, this, this journey planning uh, with, with a view to, to generate routes that will have, uh, you know, the best impact, if you like, on the user experience. And uh, the last, the second and last component that uh, I, I would like to talk about is the recommendation services component. Um, and, and this was, uh, again, it was a component based on, on machine learning. And, and the idea was actually recommend uh, Firstly, uh, plans, 
uh, packages. Again, one of the one of the key sort of elements of mass is the the package that the users actually um, have in terms of carrying out carrying out their daily daily travels. Um, so, in terms of the package, there was a recommendation service for the operators, the mass operators. And that was to assist mass operators to come up with those packages. And of course, there are uh, quite a few uh, sort of um, types of data behind that in terms of business models, in terms of the status of the cities, network, and, and other, other, other uh, information. And also, there was a recommendation uh, service for the travelers themselves. So again, um, what you can see on the right hand side is a screenshot from the mass for you application. So when when um, users were um, registering with the platform, they, they downloaded the app and they had to go through a series of questions that we actually used to define the profile of the user. And then based on that profile, we could actually recommend plans um, to the users. Uh, that that better fit that profile, uh, and, and and another aspect of this recommendation service was uh, to do the journey planner. So this was a, a sort of a, a sub component that was integrated to the route planner, and the idea here was to uh, recommend routes based on the on the user's uh, preferences. So for example, uh, uh, we collect some information about um, you know how how far a, a particular user may be willing to walk or cycle. Uh, and then we use that information as part of the general planning. Uh, so this is this was my presentation. I hope I am within my within my times, and um, you know I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have later in 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 the seminar. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you were perfect in time. And uh, please, everybody, if you have uh, questions, put them in the chat, and then uh, we will have them in the panel discussion. Now, the floor is for our second uh, speaker, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Rudolf Felix. He is uh, CEO of an um, of a fuzzy systems company, and this is why he has to move out then, uh, then uh, later, because uh, we have business and academics here in, in our session now. Um, Dr. Felix, thanks for contributing and the floor is yours. Somehow I'm sorry, but somehow I'm not able to start the presentation. I have to stop and to reshare, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Because the presentation is frozen, okay? So I'll try to start it already now. So I am not able to come to come to the presentation mode. Sorry for this. This Thanks is uh, on your local system? No, no, it is. That happened uh, to me as well. Don't worry, it's coming, we see it. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, yes, yeah. but I, I cannot, I cannot st uh, start the presentation, you know? This is my problem. No, 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 now it's fine, we can view it. Yes, yes, but I cannot start this, this PowerPoint here, you know? Okay. So what to do? Can you send them quickly to someone else who could share? Yeah, if you can send it yeah. to me, then I can yeah. present it for you. Yeah, okay. And in between, tell us a few words. Yes, yeah. uh, yes, but uh, just just a second. I will I will just send the uh, presentation. Okay. To Christoph Pilo. Yes. I'm about to sending it. So somehow everything blocks. Okay. Don't worry about that, Rudolf. Happened to yeah, me yeah, as yeah. well. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have to start getting acquainted with these new systems. So, so I have, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have. Uh, you just now, send it. Now send it to you, yeah. And I try, maybe I try it again, but somehow. Somehow the context switching, the context switching possibilities are 
not there, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I send it to you, so you must have received it. Uh, not yet, not yet. I'm, uh, uh, I'm waiting. Okay. I check if the email program has sent it to you. So it is out, yeah. Okay. Surprisingly, I can, I can, for instance, use my email program, but I cannot activate the, the PowerPoints for some reason. So, but, but I can, I can maybe, maybe I can already start talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can start okay. and talk. Yeah. So, so what, what I, I have a presentation about um, the fact that uh, mobility is not only uh, the individual mobility that many uh, applications or many discussions are uh, going around it. Uh, in our in our uh, applications, we have um, a lot of to, a lot of to do with uh, you know production processes, logistic processes, and processes supporting other processes like maintenance processes. And all in all these uh, all these processes, we are applying AI techniques and learning systems. And some examples of them are given on the on the first slide, where uh, we have a bunch of applications. And today, I would like to concentrate on the um, on the maintenance topic. Uh, the AI methods applied th there are, you know, a full uh, stack of of different AI methods like uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, fuzzy logic, neural networks, and so on. And um, but one of the very important application is uh, maintenance yeah? because maintenance processes and the example of the maintenance process I have here is a maintenance process of an electrical grid where you have a system of um, you have a system in which more or less 500 service units are traveling all the time around uh, a region like a federal, uh, a federal uh, land in, in uh, Germany. And they have to perform more or less 120 to 150,000 uh, service and maintenance uh, tasks the, uh, during uh, one year. And we are uh, dealing with uh, uh, supporting by AI techniques, uh, the dispatching process. Yeah? And uh, if we look at, uh, at the dispatching process, then we have to uh, deal with a quite complicated system of a lot of uh, KPIs that are motivated by the um, by the business process but uh, this uh, optimization has a big impact on the sustainability and here in this uh, uh, in this um, uh, slides I have an example in which way the sustainability is uh, so to say uh, implying the the mobility yeah? because you know if the service uh, units are traveling around uh, a certain region they are participants in the mobility ecosystem and uh, they are, of course, implying also the ecosystem. And if you do it efficiently, you contribute to the sustainability of the process. And uh, if you look at the figures that come out of uh, such a system, uh, is, uh, you see that uh, when uh, you consider all the traveling uh, they, they generate in the maintenance process, then uh, you have more than 5.5 million kilometers that they do uh, during a year. So this is, uh, you know, uh, many times around the world, so to say. And if you uh, consider the uh, CO2 impact, then uh, these are plenty of tons. And we manage, for instance, here by optimizing this process to reduce this by more or less 15%, which means that you have, you know, just to mention some figures, uh, more than 500,000 tons a year if you look at this kind of process is not only for one region in Germany, but for all Germany. Yeah, so this is a substantial amount of, um, of, uh, of CO2 reduction already. And if you imagine that this process is, uh, that this is only one example of a maintenance process and that you have a lot of industrial processes that are generating also maintenance requirements, then you can imagine how big this impact is if you do uh, optimize this intelligently. And uh, this is so to say more or less the conclusion of my, of my talk. Yeah? We have to look, um, 
not only on the, so to say, primary aspects of mobility, but also on the secondary aspects. Uh, what I mean is that uh, mobility is a part of the ecosystem uh, and is a part of the mobility ecosystem and many participants doing not only in individual mobility, but also doing uh, mobility that is, so to say, part of business processes are involved. And you have maintenance processes, you have service processes, you have delivery processes, you have logistics, you have uh, uh, production processes. And these processes are also, so to say, helping that mobility can take place. But on the other hand, these processes are also somehow to be optimized. And, and if you optimize them, then you generate a big impact to the optimization of sustainability. So uh, I would encourage everybody to um, look uh, also on the secondary uh, aspects of mobility in order to improve uh, prerequisites and consequences of uh, sustainability. So Rudolf. this is more or less my, my talk without, without slides, yeah? Yeah, we got a, a hint from uh, the audience uh, yes. that you could try Control plus F5. And that Control might plus help. F5, okay. Mm. I did it. Control plus F5. No. But okay. I'm true, you no. know, I'm Sorry. true. So yeah. the message is, uh, let, let us uh, look also on the side process and the secondary processes. There is a lot of potential to improve sustainability and AI methods are not only, uh, so to say, methods that in future are going to be applied, but we have already applied this. So, so that I, I would like to say AI is on, already contributing a lot uh, in, in this direction, at least in, in, in our context of our company. But I think many others will do similar things. And uh, so this is my message for today. Thank yeah, thanks. Much. And you proved you can it even uh, do with and convey perfectly without slides. Uh, by the way, your mail just uh, arrived. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. It was not uh, not just in time arrival. It was, uh, but uh, you obviously didn't need the slides. Thanks uh, for the impulse and <clears throat> for, uh, and. Uh, uh, my best wishes for the appointment later. Yeah, then thank you very much. We will, we will reroute uh, then any questions uh, later to you. Okay, thank you. Now, I will, uh, I'll be pleased to, to answer to them. And also I will then uh, integrate the slides into the frame of the conference and send it to you again. Yeah. Thank you very much. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Felix. Now our oh, first speaker is um, uh, Professor Axel Hahn from uh, office in Oldenburg and um, a member like uh, uh, Dr. Felix um, of the platform Landed Systeme. Axel, now the floor is yours. And uh, oh, I see the slides already, good. Axel? His yes. micro is not so my yeah my yeah. audio video was still off so you don't have to any um, noises and I'm not allowed to share my video actually but uh, now I am well welcome also from my side from Oldenburg and I would say I, we made it yeah and uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about the relationship of AI and autonomous transportation for sustainable and future mobility and uh, typically I would like to ask you in the beginning of my talk um, how you came today, yeah, on foot, on bike, or by bus, or I added the, if just for this month uh, I was here anyway. And of course, you see that we have a real impact of platforms and all that stuff uh, uh, on our mobility issues and our requirements on mobility and all that stuff. But of course, today I would like to re address real physical mobility. And of course, uh, there are a lot of new uh, building blocks uh, for future mobility with different ways how we handle it. And I just brought to you some uh, sketches from one of the car manufacturers uh, with me here to see that there are really big chances for future mobility. And of course, this is coming with uh, technologies and it's driven by technologies. And there's a whole bunch of new 
outcomings from research from industry to address that. And just to name some of them in my slides here, of course, we have big advantages in sensor technologies about video, about laser-based distance readings or radar-based systems. We have positioning systems and uh, uh, environment detection, bio ultrasounders and whatever. And all this data then is processed. And of course, uh, it is exchanged. So networking is uh, the second um, big building block for future mobility systems and technologies to enable all these visions we just saw in the beginning of my talk. And uh, we need a little bit of additional things like we need more, 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 more data to do that. One example I have here, uh, of course, we need uh, for our navigation, very precise maps, even with uh, information where and how to, to navigate on the streets. And uh, most of the technologies needed here are of course brought today uh, by making use of artificial, artificial intelligence. So this uh, enables a full new class of technology and functionality. Um, and uh, of course we have to ask ourselves, uh, is this really working? And is this, um, uh, can we uh, standardize it? Can we classify it? Can we certify it and bring it into uh, operation? And uh, typical applications we do here that is definitely necessary for letting uh, the cars uh, do their thing by the known is, for instance, just as an example here, predictive driving. So my vehicle has to predict the potential development of, uh, of the environment as I have to do it while I am driving a car. And of course, it's very important that um, we passing um, uh, responsibility. So, and of course, we have to deal with uh, safety and security issues here. So, the systems get more and more complex. I would even say extreme complex. And uh, our environment is not clean digital, it's um, dirty, it's analog, and it's of course not deterministical. So uh, we use machine learning to, to, to deal with all these complexities, all these systems, uh, all these different um, developments in our environment. And uh, of course, what we have to do is um, we have to certify and validate and verify our systems to, before we bring it into uh, operation. And uh, beside this technical aspects um, that is leading now to my main point of my presentation, there are sustainability, legal and ethical aspects to be addressed here. So we really have to think about what does, let me say, the impact of these new technologies, let me say, for our future society and our mobility issues. And as I said, there are sustainability issues, there are legal issues, there are ethical issues. And of course, they are already uh, handle today and uh, the people think about how to deal with that. For instance, we set up some kind of legal framework, uh, for instance, by the new amendment to the German Road Traffic Act uh, to, to 2017, so that we um, get a new understanding about the re responsibility split between manufacturers and drivers. And beyond that, of course, there's an issue with ethics in it. Um, typically, if we say if a driver is well behaving, uh, uh, she or he reacts instinctively. So uh, if a system a situation gets uh, complex, uh, the drivers do a decision and this decision may have a high impact. And um, on the other side, if we leave it to algorithms, people maybe expect that we think ahead what these uh, algorithms will, how we, they will decide. And of course, this is um, rising a lot of ethical concerns and uh, they are also ad already addressed as well by a lot of um, boards dealing with that. Just to, to mention one, whereas the uh, Commission uh, of Automated and Connected Driving uh, initiated by the German Federal Ministry of Transport and Digital Infrastructure. And for instance, what they say um, that all these issues and what are leading to, in, to accidents cannot be standardized, cannot be handled beforehand. And so therefore it's very tricky and um, maybe it's not even uh, leading us to a goal uh, when we do this uh, kind of decisions here. 
And on the other side, uh, there arose a big issue. Of course, that is very important with, with all these machine learning and platform discussions about uh, data protection. And uh, this is uh, in fact another aspect of the ethics um, and ethics is in fact a very big contribution and cornerstone to sustainability. And uh, we have to deal with something that people name digital ethics. So that is providing us an orientation uh, for a good and successful life in the digital age. So how to deal with all that thing. So uh, it is, has an impact on how we will and how we should and how we want life and how people will act uh, in a digital environment and with digital information and all that stuff. And uh, of course, uh, it is contributing to moral judgments um, uh, we would like to do. Yeah? And uh, one issue definitely is the question of privacy because uh, if we move ourselves, and of course we would like to support mobility, uh, this tells people a lot of information and a lot of uh, from, about us if they do so. So there's definitely an issue here to saying uh, that mobility data are very, very private in the end. If they are anonymized, uh, pseudonymized, whatever, they can be used, but we have to have in mind that we are this information are very, very private information, and they, if getting in the wrong hands, they tell us a lot of people uh, what they are doing and what they are feeling, what they are thinking. Another aspect I would like to raise here is uh, that coming up with, uh, of course, with all these mobility issues, is about the mobility divide. Uh, so, of course, um, all these digital things. Um, has to be discrimination free. And um, so this has to address as well, uh, mobility and automated driving services. So that is quite important that we have to feel about that, think about that as well. And uh, to summarize all the things um, I just said is, we have to think about how we will live, uh, live with autonomous mobility or what autonomous mobility can do with our life and how to support it. So, uh, if we have the vision that uh, mobility of the future will contribute by autonomous or highly automated driving, it has a lot of impact. And just imagine uh, if you get a new way and understanding of how to own and how to drive a car, there are a lot of impacts, let me say, uh, for instance, in our cities. You know? So uh, just imagine if there is no more private ownership of the car. You know? So uh, unoccupied car parks, no cars, no car dealers, no more roads. How we will live there, how we will work, and how we will drive more, and uh, what we will do with that. And um, I think that is the biggest issue here is that today, if you look out of your window, you will just detect that, um, especially the bigger city, the bigger a city gets, is more and more today oriented on uh, uh, automotive transportation. So. And um, I have a strong feeling that we should not orient our city to automobile mobility, but to humans and their requirements living in the cities. And of course, uh, mobility is a requirement of these people and we have to deal with these uh, mobility requirements to deal with that, but we should have, we should put people into a focus. And I think, uh, taking um, the uh, driver out of the game and bringing in new autonomous transportation systems, uh, we can really deal with that. And we can handle new ways of uh, concepts for urbanity, for, mo for mobile uh, systems and um, ownership of cars and all the things. So I don't think that it will reduce our, or change our need for mobility, but there's a chance that we say to bring it for a better uh, for all of us. So, and of course, just to, to, to mention that this includes a lot of business opportunities and one very simple is just to, to finalize here my talk is uh, just to mention this number from Roland Berger say that there's a, there's a big business model at least uh, in the main Western uh, societies in China, um, there was a big, 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 big deal, for instance, just for this kind of uh, people mover cars here. So my take home message for you is um, that autonomous driver has a potential for really better mobility. 
uh, but I'm pretty sure that this will be a different mobility as we have today. And uh, so we will not only need technical innovations, but we will really need new mobility concepts. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. And um, I'm sure there is, you gave us some food for thought. Please um, uh, um, put your questions uh, to Professor Hahn in, uh, in the chat, either in Zoom or MOBA, and then uh, we will re <coughs> can uh, reflect that in our discussion later. Now, the fourth keynote is given by Dr. Tobias Jakob from NEC Laboratories, in, and it's about AI-powered routing for cognitive logistics. Dr. Jakob? Yours the floor. Thank you very much. Just sharing my screen to show the presentation. So I hope you guys can see that. Um, yeah, so thanks a lot. And thanks to all of you also for attending this conference. I think this is a great opportunity. My name is Tobias Jacobs. I'm a researcher at NEC Labs Europe in Heidelberg. And today I would like to present some of the work we did in a logistics project, which has been funded by the H2020 framework. So my short talk has actually two parts. Um, in the first part, I want to give a brief introduction of the European project that is called COCLO, which stands, as you can see on the slide, for cognitive logistics. And this is going to be, so to speak, the macro view of things. And after that, I want to, you know, zoom in uh, pretty much into the micro view. And I'm going to, pre I'm going to present a um, particular piece of research work related to AI for logistics planning, planning which we did in, with my colleagues um, in this project. So let's start with the macro view. Um, COGLO, as I said, is, um, um, stands for cognitive logistics. And yeah, in this project, we are having this concept, um, which I will explain on the next slide. And we are conduct conducting pilots uh, with our implementations with um, logistics partners across Europe, which you see actually on the very right hand side of the slide. So we have the Slovenian, the Croatian postal operator, we have the Greek postal operator, and we have Ecor, which is a large Turkish logistics uh, company also operating across Europe. And on the side of optimization and big data analytics, we have, well, we have NEC, that's my company. And we are also closely collaborating with folks from the Josef Stefan Institute in Slovenia and the Athens University of Economics and Business. And then we have many more partners doing many more things in this project. And I think I could easily fill a one hour talk about the concept of the project, but let me just briefly explain what we mean by cognitive logistics, right? Um, so the first class citizens in our framework is what we call the cognitive logistics object. And those guys are actually so important that we even give them an acronym. We call them CLOs. And these CLOs, they are actually the active participants of the logistics processes. And they, you know, you can imagine them as the trucks, the warehouses, um, the drivers, um, the ships, the trains, you know, we are looking at multimodal transport here. And, um, well, they obviously have a physical appearance, right? So they are physical objects. They have a physical representation in the real world. And we give them a virtual representation in the, in the yeah, virtual in the cyberspace, if you want to use an 80s term. Uh, so in other words, these physical objects, they have a digital twin um, with which it is regularly exchanging information. And for those of you who are familiar with concepts of the Internet of Things, um, this might sound very familiar. Um, and what we add on top of that is a social network, social network, but it's a social network, a social Internet of Things. So the um, these, these things, the virtual representation, they get social and communicate with each other. For example, when something happens in the physical world, like a truck is breaking down, or there is an ad hoc parcel and an ad hoc pri high priority parcel to deliver, or whatever else can happen in the world of logistics, when this happens, then the objects are 
getting social and try to jointly find a solution and help each other. And this happens in a fully automated manner. Um, but despite all those social objects and things for decision making and for optimization, we still need some global overview. So we still need some planning and optimization components. And this is where AI and big data analytics actually comes into play. We call this component the cognitive advisor. Um, but I think um, you don't, you know, the important things is the cognitive uh, logistics objects. These are the first class citizens. So um, this actually ends already the Mac review of the talk. So let's now zoom in a bit more and talk about machine learning in logistics. Um, so I lost my slides. So here is again. Um, we are looking at optimization, optimization processes in logistics, where we have um, actually we're looking at um, this, this cycle of, of, um, of what is happening. And actually, we have several places where big data analytics and machine learning is beneficial. So let's start from the bubble below, which is the application. And so the physical world, basically, um, where we, of course, we have tons of data these days generated by sensors, by, by the tracking system, by everything. And I think it's needless to say that this data is, um, well, a rich source for machine learning and data analytics. Um, so, and act, yeah, well, you can many, do many things with the data, but for the optimization process, and there are actually two crucial parts. First is to fill in data, which is miss, which would be good to, to know for optimization, but which might be missing. So, and here, this is something where data analytics and uh, machine learning can help. And second, even more importantly, to project into the future. So to analyze what if scenarios, what happens if this decision is being made? Uh, what happens if this decision is being made to help actually with optimization and decision making? And then from this data, we are generating a problem instance. Um, we are generating a problem instance to solve, for example, to compute the best schedule um, or the best routes, like the things you have to do in logistics. Um, now, such a problem instance, this is where, you know, this is somehow a, a highly structured object, a highly structured discrete object. You know, you have variables, you have equations, you have constraints. But the off-the-shelf machine learning libraries, they don't want to have these structural objects. They want to have a bunch of numbers. They want to have a high dimensional vector, like a picture you can easily represent as a high dimensional vector. Uh, but you know, a formula, how do you represent this? And so to get this into a machine learnable uh, format, um, which is also called an embedding, right? So maybe you have heard this term. Um, this is a topic of, topic of representation learning. Embeddings typically they appear in the context of natural language processing, or they can represent discrete objects like graphs. But we here we build them from optimization problem instances. And then once we have a representation of those problems, which are then machine learning ready, so to speak, we can solve them, um, those problems using optimization methods this time from machine learning. So in the next two slides, I want to explain how we use a tech, the techniques of technique of reinforcement learning for doing that. So this is getting a bit more technical now again. So what we are interested to, to achieve is robustness. So robust solutions, schedules or routes. And this uh, using reinforcement learning works as follows. We train a reinforcement learning agent basically using more or less state-of-the-art methods uh, for, for, um, for implementing uh, those agents. And, but the training set here is a database of historical problem instances. So problem instances that we have seen so far. We can also use synthetic problem instances if we don't have real ones, but you know, we have to, they have to be close to the real world instances because otherwise we are training on things that we are not seeing in reality. And then, um, you know, whenever this agent during training is generating a solution, it's generating a solution, which is what the agent is actually doing. Um, then we are um, we are evaluating this solution, um, but looking at the worst case, what can happen? So we are making a pessimistic evaluation. What is the worst thing that can happen? Um, well, within some boundaries, but um, what is the worst thing that can happen if we apply the solution? 
And um, well, then after training, after having seen, I don't know, thousands of instances um, and having done this systematic try and error process, which is kind of typical for reinforcement learning, and then the agent, well, it will not be optimal in the sense of combinatorial optimization because you know even with machine learning we cannot do the magic so we cannot really solve np hard logistics problems but the agent will behave like a very good heuristic for the given problem um, so a heuristic which is going to be sp specialized to the actual distribution of problem instances that we have used for training and the reason why we use this pessimism is that we want to make the agent robust against uncertainty so the agent will be rather conservative and make build solutions which are going to perform reasonable even if the input has some misspecification even if something is going wrong um, here we have some experimental results um, of course it's just you know just very few of them and we of course we have project reports where you can see all the results certainly um, anyway uh, what happens during training is you can see on the left hand side um, so we here we have the feedback signal that the agent receives or training so from left or right the agent has seen more and more uh, instances and has generated more and more experimental solutions during training and then um, on the horizon uh, on this other axis um, you have the feedback received by the agent higher is better um, obviously and so you see this what, what is happening during training. So the agent is improving itself. And at the end, it, at some point it converges and we can stop with the training. And on the right-hand side, um, we actually have a performance comparison with some baselines for optimization. So we have compared it with uh, simple greedy heuristics and we have compared it with a bit more involved iterative heuristics. Uh, here we are looking at the distances which are traveled for serving all the requests in this uh, routing problem. And so here, lower is better. And uh, in this particular, so this is for the capacitated vehicle routing problem. And here we were able to beat those baselines after training, of course, we first need to train the agent. Um, we also have done experiments for other problems. So um, in general, we always have this trend. Of course, it's not a, you know it's not always working. Sometimes it does not work as well. But um, I think it's an approach which is um, which is pretty promising. So that was my talk already. Thank you very much for listening. So the take-home messages are um, the Coglo project explores applications of concepts from IoT and social networks for logistics. Um, we are running pilots across four European countries. And as a particular piece of, of work, uh, particularly relevant for AI, we are doing logistics optimization via reinforcement learning. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have questions, I would have you to answer them later. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Jacobs. Now, our... Um... Next speaker is Dr. Anatoly Sherman from SIG, and it will be about automation of load and unload processes in logistic centers. Dr. Sherman, the floor is yours. I think he has some yes, technical thank issues. You. Okay, he's there. Now, now, right. now that's everything is fine, so let's see. Can you see the presentation? Not yet. This one. No? We can see it, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much. So now, uh, yeah, it's about, let's say, uh, um, so my presentation is, uh, as Mr. Paleo said, is about actually, um, yeah, loading or let's say automation tests for logistic centers and uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I'll hope I give you an overview on, on that from uh, from uh, from uh, from let's say um, let's say automation sensor uh, deliver uh, point of view. Yeah. Yes. So uh, first, shortly about. Uh, so I come from uh, from the company Zik. It's a sensor uh, industrial sensor provider. We run about ten thousand people, and uh, yeah. So we have different kind of technology, and actually we automate the. Let's say we are shop floor guys that automate the factory and logistic and uh, process uh, uh, industries, let's say. Yeah, so um, that's about that. 
Um, yes, yeah, so I think uh, actually um, I, I like really the the, the presentation of uh, Mr. Felix, even if we did not have slides, because actually I have similar messages as, as, as he has. Yeah, and it's about that that the mobility or, or logistics it starts also in factories and logistics. Yeah, it's actually integrated part of it, even if maybe it's a niche or kind of secondary uh, uh, secondary uh, test, but actually that's 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 also integrated part of mobility. And uh, my talk is all about, let's say, automation uh, and use of AI or yeah, um, uh, AI in factories and logistics yeah, for specific tasks like uh, loading and unloading. Yeah. And uh, yeah, first maybe about AI. So yeah, if, if, if you, yeah, there is a lot of deficiency of what, what is AI about. So, and if we look from the Wikipedia, so that's any device that perceives of its environment and takes actions that maximize the chance of successfully achieving its goals. And if I project that in, uh, let's say, in, in, the, in the field I'd like to talk is actually, so device that perceives the environment, that would be, uh, in my case, would be 3D snapshot cameras, uh, different types of them, uh, time of flight or austere or other, let's say, vision cameras. So uh, actually that's, that's the eyes of the of the of the mobile uh, platform or of the of the machine, yeah, and achieve the goals. The goals is actually to to solve interlogistic application to automate and make actually autonomous uh, even machines uh, in the logistic and factory areas, yeah. So that's actually that's that's all about. And I'll give you hopefully like really field examples uh, where we are staying now. Let's say in terms of AI, in terms of solving logistic applications for transport logistics, yeah. So and that's about, uh, that's the talk is about that. So shortly about uh, just that you understand uh, before I talk into application, what the sensors uh, that we are providing is are about, what they deliver, yeah? So uh, um, they deliver actually, they see the, the world as, as we humans see. So uh, we, uh, they deliver actually, they see the, let's say the, the, the pictures, it's a vision, let's say sensor. They see the picture like it can be in a, like color picture on RGB or it can be also, let's say, a 2D information in grayscale on infrared, like you see here, for example, where you see these boxes, which are also part of the stock. Yeah. And in addition, these cameras, the 3D snapshot, uh, 3D snapshot cameras delivers the, the depth information. It means actually it, 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 it tells what is the distance of their object that this camera sees, uh, uh, for example, these, uh, yeah, these boxes or, or other parts. To the camera so it's depth or distance information yeah and all these cameras independently from the physics of them it can be three the time of light it can be stereo vision it can be structured light uh, cameras they're all delivered by the end of the day 3d and 2d data yeah and that's why we call let's say in our jargon it's uh, 3d snapshot cameras yeah? and now uh yes yeah, so uh, as let's say um it's about automation tests loading unloaded in the logistics so uh of course, in the logistic area that has, that's a 24-7, uh, there are different kind of uh, environmental uh, conditions that uh, also the sensors and the cameras has to, uh, has, to, has to deal with. And let's say, of course, the camera delivers the data, but also the, the hardware itself shall be actually, ad shall adapt this environment. It means actually that also by design, the, the sensors or the, let's say the organs that, that, uh, that, have, that have these eyes to, to see the data they also need let's say uh, to have some kind of specific um, yeah uh, hardware qualities in order to be able to um, uh, to 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 act 24 7 and you can imagine in factory for example if you have some uh, some some sensing uh, organs that uh, that uh, that are I don't know that do inspection or dimensioning task of some goods uh, or inspection of quality uh, and if they don't do it, so then the, you have conveyor that is actually, yeah, that's, that's is offline. And that's cost a lot of money. So that's actually a very important part to understand when you automate, when you deal with the AI, with, when you deal with the data, with the, also with the physics in their, in their, uh, on the shop floor in the logistic and, and factory. So now I, um, to, the, to the main part um, for the different kind of task, automation tests. Uh, towards, let's say, putting there. So actually, I, I, I like this picture. It's quite complicated, but it, 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 shows, it shows, let's say, the, an overview from the top, what is the processes uh, of, the, of the goods, of their goods, um, when they go to the, let's say, uh, from, the, from the logistic, let's say, 
when they come from the transport from the trucks and goes to the trucks yeah and in between there is a factory yeah and logistics yeah and what happens in between and what uh what can be optimized uh with uh, let's say with ai and with uh let's say with um with machine vision let's say algorithms within this process yeah core transport logistics yeah? and uh, i'll give you a few examples on that so um yeah uh, first of all in order to provide let's say the the goods into the transport uh, first there is also different kind of um uh, move, movements are necessary that there are kind of transport robots within the factory that transport uh, the transport um yeah goods from a to b and for that uh, they also need eyes yeah and uh, and or in order to let's say to load this kind of let's say dollies that's the dragon into the also into the trucks um, it can be done automatically and uh, this is actually done with a with a 3d camera where the uh, evaluation of the data let's say the 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 machine vision part happens in the camera happens in the in the in the sensor yes yeah? so it's kind of edge uh, edge computing uh, approach and i think yeah so you see here one uh, one example so the camera the the, the data the, uh, let's say let's say enhanced by ai you can easily let's say uh, yeah do the the detection of the dolly and to to evaluate the position of that in order to be able to help the this 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 machine this transport uh, machine to to pick up the, the 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 goods yeah the dolly so this is one example another example is uh, of course when the when the forklift truck um, uh, usually there are different kind of processes where where how to, how to put the goods into the uh, trailers yeah uh, one of the processes is actually one pickups from the higher rack the pellet yeah with the goods and then mm, and then uh, uh, drives uh, uh, through the logistics center and then uh, pick, uh, and then goes into the trailer yeah and in order to pick up the the um, one of the challenges that we have currently even if it uh, happens with a driver or autonomous that if you would like to pick up the the um, uh, the, the, the 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 pellet from the high rack, you need kind of a uh, kind of ice. Otherwise, it's quite difficult. You can imagine ten meters over there over there the floor. The the guy doesn't see anything, so it needs kind of uh, navigation. And this is also happen with a uh, with um, um this can happen with a with a three D let's say vision sensor. Yeah, where also here the evaluation of the data they. Uh, happens in the camera once again enhanced enhanced by ai yeah um yeah so where the uh, where the algorithms are say uh, let's say by end of the day gives you the gives the the, um, the forklifts uh, driver the the coordinates of the of the pellet where to navigate yeah so this is also an additional examples uh, where where the where the ai in the logistic or in factory already helps to the let's say to mobility yeah? okay um Next is example is actually I I am I still not allowed let's say to share any any more more uh, let's say uh, nice pictures but uh, let's let's uh, try to imagine so uh, here you see the the trailers and also here the trailers and one of the one very important part of the of this uh, of this let's say loading and unloading let's say the uh, trucks is um, is uh, how how can I optimize the space within the truck in order in order that the truck will not, yeah, will not uh, drive uh, half uh, half empty? Let's say, yeah, it's kind of Tetris if you'd like uh, that currently happens with the uh, in best case with some guy that actually yeah uh, comes and looks where I can put this uh, where I can put a specific box in order to have uh, the Tetris let's say in a in more optimized way in the trailer yeah so. And here there are different, let's say, um, uh, with the with the with the help of sensors and uh, and evaluation of the data of the sensor based on the AI. It's also helpful. It's also possible to optimize this process. For example, I can already let's say um, evaluate the dimension and also classify the the objects when they on the conveyor. Yeah, this can happen, for example, with uh, with this kind of 3D snapshot camera. And then, in addition, I can also observe the the the, the level of the um, uh, of the uh, how of the load, let's say, within the truck, how full or how empty is that? Yeah. And based on their information that I know that there is a different goods with different, let's say, properties like dimension, like other properties, I can then guide the robot in order to uh, to put these goods 
in a more, let's say, efficient way, yeah? And this is, uh, of course, also very, yeah, it's a test that currently still done manually if, 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 uh, or that, that did not, or still, let's say, in their, how to say, in the ramp up phase, yeah? And uh, there are many projects currently running from, uh, you know, from all the logistics suppliers in order to automate this process, yeah? And this is also an important part where AI, of course, is, is, is in an integrated part of it, yeah? So part of the evaluation can happen in the, in the camera, but also many parts, in, especially in this process, can help, it can also be, 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 be evaluated on the cloud, yeah? Because you can, you can imagine that you can deal with this information of the classification of the dimension, you can, you can upload this information from the sensor via OPC UR or other protocols directly to the cloud or, or further to, into the pyramid in order to help to the logistic provider to deal with the data, to understand, uh, to trace the data, to to prevent, uh, to let's say, to prevent maintenance and uh, and uh, and um, and similar stuff. So, this is also part of um, of of this, let's say, process. Yeah. And uh, yeah, um, maybe the the last example is also let's say, what can be done. I mean, uh, yeah, to to help the the operator on the logistic part when she let's say uh, deals with uh, with the goods. It's also, let's say, um, maybe I'll put it here, yeah? So it's actually that the, the camera is, um, you know, the, the CPU and all these uh, vision-based, let's say, um, vision-based processors, it's currently really, let's say, really dynamic field, yeah? And with the time, let's say, even now it's possible to process, let's say, deep learning or other uh, maybe lean deep learning algorithms within the camera, yeah? So we integrated actually the, the, the processor, which is able to process also deep learning um, algorithms within the camera in order to, uh, to track the, 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 the people or the operator. And uh, by that, let's say uh, the, the project called Follow Me, where the, let's say the transport, uh, the, the, the AGV or the, let's say the, the mobile robot can follow the operator. Yeah? And of, of course, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, use cases where you can imagine, as you can see, where it helps already to, to optimize the, the, yeah, the, the process. And of, of course, also it contributes to the health of the, of the operators. Yeah, so actually that's my last slide. Um, um, so I, I gave you an examples, uh, maybe mainly examples, what can be, be done with the AI within the sensors on the shop floor uh, level, yeah? Uh, what can be solved like edge computing uh, approach uh, for the, let's say, fast cycles uh, applications. There are different applications. Uh, and I think in this audience, mainly the, the, the interest is, let's say, an application that's maybe a, a low, slow cycles where the data of this device can be also used in the cloud in order to, to do different kind of traceability or different kind of, let's say, digital twins applications that, that are necessary also for the, for, for the mobility or transport uh, logistic in the general term. And, uh, and the, the devices, let's say the sensors uh, that we have actually also have these, these interfaces in order to communicate also on the, on the shop floor uh, level with the actors, uh, with the PLCs, but also has the interface in order to communicate directly with the, with the clients on the cloud, yeah? And this is something, of course, that's very important for the digitalization and automation in factories and logistics. That was uh, my last slide, and uh, I thank you for your attention. Great. Okay. So um, thanks a lot again, Dr. Sherman, for this uh, very interesting presentation. And I hope you will uh, share the slides later. Now it's uh, our last panel talk. It's big data for mobility, tracking knowledge extraction in urban areas uh, given by Dr. Ibad Qureshi. He's a senior researcher, uh, research scientist in the Indecom system. Actually, we have a change. Uh, oh. Ivet is replaced by Yanis Theodori this way on board. Oh, except my apologies. So sorry for that. But no problem. No problem. <laughs>
First off, thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Vivian, for organizing this uh, session. Let me try to share my screen now, the most difficult part of the day. <laughs> is it okay? That is fine. Okay, good. Since I passed this uh, exercise, everything will work now on. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Yanis Todoridis. I'm the technical manager of the Track and Know project and the professor at the University of Piraeus. Uh, Ibat Kuresi is the, the, uh, the project coordinator of uh, Track and Know. Today, I will uh, give you the highlights uh, of our project, which comes to its end, uh, end of uh, December. So let me quickly pass the introduction and uh, let me give you one minute uh, short, uh, let's say, intro of uh, what, uh, how we're starting and how we are today. Uh, all this uh, story of uh, mobility data management, mobility data analytics started about early 90s, which is 30 years uh, from uh, uh, back from now, where we started working on uh, adding time in uh, the spatial information. So uh, we have a uh, pairs of a point uh, locations and the timestamps. And at that time, we were very happy that we had a new uh, means, let's say, of information to work with. Just space and time, just spatial and temporal information. Of course, with the time, it appeared that it was not enough. Today, we have much more wealth in our uh, information. Uh, we have uh, our uh, tracking, uh, daily routines. Uh, we have our uh, sensors uh, looking at our, uh, let's say, health. Uh, we have uh, our tweets where we have, uh, again, space and time, and um, so on. And we have a lot, a lot of uh, very, very, let's say, rich uh, information from the very simple point in time. Now we have a lot of data to work with. Out of this, let's say, a world of data, when we started this track and know, uh, we had uh, some uh, objectives. And uh, the objectives were how to let's say, use the big data technologies and the data analytics, of course, technologies in order to have useful, to extract useful knowledge from uh, the movement of uh, people, mainly, you will see the exams a bit later, in urban areas. Uh, so uh, the idea was to have a, a software framework with some application domains, of course, uh, that will uh, combine mobility data management, complex event recognition, network analytics, visual analytics, uh, of course, in order to have new models and uh, be, let's say, uh, fresh and ready for new applications. We have three pilots in our track and know project, and uh, I give you just some hints of uh, the data sets that are behind, because we are, have different types of uh, data. Our first pilot comes from Vodafone Inovus uh, and it has to do with transportation. We have millions of uh, trips, billions of uh, locations. The trips are mainly by trucks in uh, Greece and uh, the vast majority is on the wider metropolitan area of Athens. And uh, this information is enriched, you will see how, in the slides that will follow, with weather and points uh, of interest. This why we have all this information, in order to reach some objectives. Uh, energy uh, consumption monitoring, uh, the networks, the mobility networks that uh, these uh, tracks uh, follow, if it is a routine or some ad hoc uh, change, let's say, to the routine uh, um, net, uh, mobility uh, network that uh, has been uh, scheduled. 
enter this and that. From uh, trucks and this kind of transportation, which of course is very useful and very, uh, let's say, typical application, we come to uh, some uh, specialized uh, case, which is uh, the car insurance. Um, as we all know, car insurance industry changes from static, uh, just one contract uh, that uh, fits uh, everything. Uh, we come to customize the uh, types of contracts and uh, customization has also to do with the mobility of uh, people, not only the age, uh, the gender, uh, the health status perhaps, but also the mobility. So uh, this is the second pilot uh, that uh, is uh, led by Systematica uh, company in Italy and uh, in this uh, pilot we have uh, some uh, let's say a bit different kind of information than the first one of course we have a more uh, the tracking the tracking of uh, the private vehicles but we also have information about the road to traffic uh, the concentration that may appear we have uh, the origin destination matrices uh, behind every single let's say uh, person and uh, this way we can have uh, some uh, more let's say specialized uh, analysis about what is the crash risk prediction what about the carpooling application if uh, two people uh, two persons uh, usually have uh, the similar habits why not uh, join them uh, together uh, this is very uh, nice uh, these are very nice applications uh, the data cover uh, a very large part of Italy and also the London uh, wider uh, area. In the third data set, we come to a much more different, let's say, application. And by the way, the idea is that we build a software that can cover very different applications. This is why we selected all these, uh, uh, let's say, pilots. In the third data set, in the third pilot, we have healthcare services led by Royal Papworth uh, in um, in UK. In this specific, let's say, uh, application, for sure, since the data is much more uh, critical, sensitive uh, than uh, since we talk about patients uh, than the other two uh, pilots, we have. Uh, synthetic data that uh, have reconstructed typical behaviors of uh, people. Above, using this data, we focused on uh, OSA, obstructive sleep apnea, and the services that are offered uh, to, uh, to these uh, people. So, where are these people located? Where are the uh, service, uh, let's say, points are located? how to do some location and location uh, uh, analysis. Uh, can I have uh, some uh, different, uh, let's say, uh, treatment in, in terms of uh, uh, different uh, people in different uh, locations? Uh, so we have also analysis of uh, this kind of uh, data in this kind of applications. Okay, this was more or less the idea of the pilots and the data that we had in hand. Our first uh, questions were uh, fundamental. Are these data large, complex? Can we call them uh, big data? What is big data? If it is a terabytes, it is okay, it is big data. What about diversity? The variety, one of the three, let's say, Vs that uh, as we call, as we say in the big data terminology. And what about the velocity? The other very important V of these uh, three Vs about, uh, apart from uh, volume. So is this data useful? And if yes, uh, what kind of analysis should we perform in order to uh, extract useful uh, knowledge? What are the specific software tools that are around? And if these tools are not a uh, hadn't, let's say, percent uh, ideal for us, what, are, what is the software that we should uh, implement uh, in order to reach our objectives? 
from data processing to data and uh, knowledge visualization. So we followed, let's say, a, a typical uh, roadmap from uh, the bottom level, which has to do with the data processing, to the upper level, which has to do with the uh, uh, visualization of data. At the bottom level, we talk about our big data processing uh, component, uh, where we collect the data, we cleanse the data, we enrich our data, very important with weather points of information and other uh, kind of uh, info. We summarize the data because we feel that in some cases data is very large to be stored and no need to store all this data. So summarization may be interesting there. And we process the data, this data with no SQL systems. Uh, one level uh, above, uh, we go to the big data analytics uh, pro, uh, module where we actually make analysis of this uh, cleaned and rich uh, uh, data, just some uh, keywords. Uh, in this uh, slide, we extract uh, the individual mobility networks, graphs that uh, represent uh, the motion, the movement of uh, our uh, uh, objectives. Uh, we talk about uh, driver profiling. If this driver, uh, let's say, performs smoothly or uh, as an outlier, regarding his or her, uh, her past movement or regarding the entire population uh, movement. We also we have also worked with the predictive analytics uh, about uh, traffic, about a specific uh, custom uh, individual at individual level uh, uh, movement either with the data mining, uh, traditional data mining techniques or with deep learning techniques, which is more, let's say, fancy and more uh, interesting nowadays. We have also uh, work on complex events. Um, let's say a, a rule that says that uh, if a driver work, uh, drives uh, with a speed of above uh, 100 kilometers, in a highway is okay, but if it is raining, for instance, it is not uh, okay. When we receive information from the driver, from uh, the weather, from uh, the road network, if it is highway or not, then we may, let's say, blend everything together in a complex event and uh, find out that now what happens here is a violation, let's say, of a rule uh, number something X. How do we learn from complex uh, event uh, patterns? And of course, above all, since, uh, uh, let's say, an image makes thousands of words, we need to have a uh, nice visualizations, uh, visualizations of the data, visualizations of the results of our uh, analytics. Uh, we have uh, developed a very interesting, very uh, insightful, I could uh, say, dashboards for uh, all our pilots and uh, customized for the target uh, audience. Uh, technicians, te technical people uh, would like to see other, let's say, information than non-technical people at the management, let's say, uh, level of uh, an enterprise. Everything is, uh, let's say, compiled in our track and know platform. And uh, of course, uh, this uh, figure may not be very clear, but uh, because of the font size, uh, but uh, you can see uh, at the left, the data uh, sources that feed all this uh, architecture. Uh, you can see uh, the toolboxes at the right, the big data processing, the big data analytics uh, toolbox, and uh, above are the pilots. We are, we are very proud that uh, we insisted on making a lot of our uh, results uh, public uh, for a, a general, uh, let's say, use by the community. 
the academic community and the industrial community, of course. So far, uh, we have uh, nine, and uh, this number will be much higher within the next uh, two months, uh, where we, since we finish the project and uh, a lot of components uh, come to their end. We have nine software packages which are uh, public, which are open uh, to everybody. Uh, we would be very happy if uh, you would uh, use some of uh, this uh, software and uh, give us uh, feedback from uh, processing to analytics. So uh, let me summarize since I feel that the time is very close to its end. Uh, the mobility data analytics era, of course, uh, area has a, a lot of success stories from processing to analytics. Uh, today, uh, the story has to do with the context management. When, where, what, what how it happened, why it uh, happened. And of course, uh, big data, which is uh, ubiquitous, I, I would say. And we are very, very uh, glad that uh, with our project, we contributed some, let's say, points to this uh, new era. This was from my side. Many thanks for attending. Uh, we have uh, a lot of information in the Track and No project uh, website. Thank so uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your <clears throat> for your presentation. Unfortunately, we are uh, we are rather short in time now, so uh, um, real panel discussion is difficult to arrange. I saw saw two questions I would like uh, to um, uh, to ask. Um, so one from uh, Ralph Klinkenberg from Rapid Miner. It's uh, by the way uh, nice that you joined us. Welcome to our to our panel. And uh, his question was, what kind of metrics is used? And I think this was directed uh, uh, um, towards uh, Mr. Jacobs. Uh, he uh, this question was uh, raised during that talk. Uh, could you um, reply on that, Dr. Jacobs? I'm sorry, I'm not sure whether I understand the question if you say what kind of metrics is used. Uh, <laughs> um, well, you know, in the first step, um, you know, we are taking the discrete structure of the graph. I don't know if this question relates to that. We have the discrete structure of the problem instance, which is represented by a graph, and then we computing a graph embedding. Um, ah, the performance graph without a label was shown. And um, okay, so this performance graph actually um, was, um, okay, this was probably um, on the table where we compared it with state of the art. So here we are, we're actually looking at the, um, at the, um, at the um, cost of the solution cost in the sense of um, the, the, the travel time or the travel distance that has to be traveled by all the vehicles in this particular logistics problems. And um, we were trying to minimize that. So if, if, you, if this is what you mean. And um, what is shown in the table um, was actually shown this number. We normalized it uh, to a one by one uh, matrix in order to make it better comparable uh, within the different um, uh, between the different instances. Okay, I see in some comment that the question was answered. Thanks. Okay. So thanks a lot. Since uh, we have uh, only very short time left, um, I would ask uh, all the all the panelists uh, one just one question, and I I will to ask you to give a very short and crisp answers. So you all know the current activities in Europe in um, trying to. To, uh, to manage the risk of AI. So by, um, um, by assessing AI and, uh, and, uh, the, and defining thresholds for explainability, for risk management, in, and since uh, mobility and logistics belongs to critical infrastructure and is system critical, this will be applied to those fields as well. Where do you find that the current discussion might endanger your current research or work which you have proposed? 
So the current disc uh, discussion, uh, to give you more context, so uh, either sectoral reg uh, legislation or, um, or a horizontal approach, which could restrict all AI in, in given context or, um, or make certification um, um, unnecessary for that. What's your view on that? Will that hamper your research, your work, or is that something which is good and positive to differentiate against uh, other uh, offerings? May I? Yeah. Yeah, it's Janis. Uh, explainable AI is a very, very interesting story. It is in its first, uh, let's say, uh, steps. I guess that it will be very uh, mature uh, in the years to come. Uh, we should work on this because uh, this has to do with, uh, let's say, how to promote the results, uh, not only to uh, the industry that uh, has to do with the specific uh, results, but also to the general uh, audience. Uh, privacy, we know, is also a very big uh, uh, issue. Uh, uh, in general, I take all these challenges as uh, opportunities for new research. This is my personal, let's say, uh, attitude. So, uh, all what you mentioned is very nice, let's say, uh, tasks for uh, future work. And in the next uh, projects that uh, will follow our current, let's say, uh, work, I'm pretty sure that uh, this uh, point will be of uh, very key importance in our uh, research. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, if I may say something, um, in NEC labs, in my workplace, um, we are actually we have actually started to look also at explainable AI um, since a year ago or something. We have some first publications there, and it's also an opportunity for us, and it's also a differentiator. And you know, there's a market needs for it, and I think we should be addressing them and. I mean, this is going to be, you know, a game between technology and politics and what people, you know, what, what the population wants. And, you know, this is not yet anywhere to converging, you know, we, we don't have, have not even yet agreed on a common definition of explainable AI, but I think we should not, you know, we should also not be afraid to make mistakes there, you know, we should just um, propose things, um, how this can be done. And this might be taken up then by politics to make some, uh, um, concrete proposal of what would be the appropriate definition of explainable AI, maybe in different contexts, uh, contexts, and then have some have some requirement, legal requirements or have some standards established on that. So I think it's very interesting and it's very important and we should, should really look into it. I, I see it really positive also. Great, Tobias. Since we really need to close, unfortunately, as up because there are other sessions on the flow, I would like to thank everyone uh, that has seen our presentations. I also allowed on the chat for, for direct questions on contributions or your participation for the mobility track. Feel free to email me or you can contact somebody from BDVA. They can direct the email to me. Myself and Christoph would like to thank the speakers. First of all, uh, business curiosity and research curiosity uh, is what is triggering us. Christoph, something to close up the session? Christoph, you want to say something? Yeah. You were mute. Well, it would have been great to, to hear the other statements of the panelists uh, uh, to that one question. But uh, when uh, time is obviously eaten up. So thanks again for participating. And I would have enjoyed to have a longer discussion with you because uh, all, all that talks deserve it. And uh, I hope at, um, uh, that we will meet again and have the, uh, the opportunity to resume our our conversation and discussion and thanks everybody for uh, for contributing and for joining that's a good promise next bdvf hopefully you know a tete a tete uh, an actual physical meeting and everything bad to be left behind thank you all thanks and bye let's bye. keep in touch take care all the best and stay healthy stay healthy of course thank you